Hello and welcome to the NC podcast. My name is Natasha Collins and I am the host and founder of NC Real Estate, which includes its awesome members club. If you have not been over to my website, please head to ncrealestate.co.uk where you will find so much goodness. Please head over there. If you've not seen it, I don't know why not. If you've been listening to this podcast for a long time, probably should have already been over there, but come anyway. Okay, let's get straight into what we've got to do today. I am so excited to welcome Katie Kendrick onto the podcast. Katie is the force behind the National Leasehold Campaign. She sits on the Leasehold Knowledge Partnership as a board trustee and is also a practicing pediatric nurse. Katie, welcome. Hi, Natasha. Thanks for having me. Oh, my pleasure. So for those of you who haven't come across Katie before. I'm really excited to introduce you. I actually came across Katie on Twitter, I think. That was where I, like, we started yeah. following each other's posts. Uh -huh. yeah. um, and we were talking about a lot of the same things um, when it came to leasehold. And I know that you are a leasehold, you specialize in that, and we'll jump into that in a minute. But for property investors and landlords who are listening to this, you really do need to be taking notes. I know that some of you listen to me ranting on about leasehold, right? Today we're digging deep into it. So don't turn this off and think, no, I don't want to discuss leasehold. We do need to discuss it. That's why I brought Katie on. She is honestly phenomenal. She is a woman after my own heart. We had a couple of hour conversation a couple of weeks ago and we were like, we have to come back and record this as a podcast. So here we are. Katie, let's let's jump in. Firstly, why did you okay. get started with the National Leasehold Campaign? Wow. Um, I fell in love with my new build house. I um, thought it was everything I wanted it to be in 2014. Um, lovely four bedroom detached with my, my husband and my little boy. But it was leasehold. Um, I didn't necessarily want leasehold, but there was no other choice in the Northwest where I live in England all new builds were leasehold. So the sales lady said, don't worry, you can buy the freehold for a couple of thousands, come on in. So we went ahead and we moved into our lovely house, which was leasehold. And then a big black cloud came 18 months later when I got a letter saying that my freehold had been sold to an investment company. And to be honest, I didn't really know what that meant. Um, they said that nothing will change. You'll just pay your ground rent to a different person. So I thought, oh, well, that's okay. And then my neighbor came knocking on my door one day and said, Katie, Katie, do you not realize what this means? And I was like, no. And basically everything changed on that moment that they sold out, um, everything. So permission to build a conservatory, um, the developer wanted 300 pound, which was relatively reasonable. The new freeholder wanted £2,600 for permission to build a conservatory. So I thought that cannot be right. So I started digging and digging and yeah, that was right. So I thought, right, I'll go and buy my freehold. I'll pay a couple of thousand and I'll be out of this. No, they then wanted £13,000 for my freehold. Um, so I went running around my estate, you know, have you heard this? Have you heard the news? But on my estate, we all have different leases. There's three different types of leases on one housing estate. We have doubling ground rents every 10 years. Mine, thankfully, isn't one of those. Um, so those people with doubling ground rents, they wanted 30 or 40,000 pounds to buy their freehold. And I just thought this can, cannot be right. We, we've bought our homes, we've got mortgages, something's gone wrong. So I'm one of those people, I don't like moaning unless I'm going to do something about it. So I began this little local Facebook group um, and then people were joining from all over the country um, and it just got bigger and bigger. And I literally opened this can of worms and, you know, it wasn't just houses that, that I think houses was the icing on the cake. Um, I think, you know, the flats and the abuses that go on in the leasehold system to do with flats and the service charges and and I've just become embroiled in this, in this web of leasehold that I never knew existed. I literally just wanted to live in peace in my home. And I now I'm, I can't because I've opened up this can of worms that we need to fix. We need to fix it. 
did you buy your end up buying your freehold so i'm actually at the very very end of my enfranchisement journey so no i'm still leasehold technically and um, we're at the very very end in the last couple of months we've agreed our price and now we're just agreeing the terms which which really is the sting in the tail so it's not just going through the whole process of buying your freehold it's then trying to agree what terms they keep in because they still want to have their income so um it's it's yeah it's been a long journey Mm-hmm. Oh, it's so <laughs> frustrating. The NLC has grown rapidly. What are you seeing in the market right now? Why does it keep growing? What are you seeing? Where's the anger coming from? Like, what's going on? So, yeah, so it's grown and we've now got over 19,000 members. Um, so the main issue is really because leasehold houses have tipped the scale and obviously it's all in the press and, you know, the publicity that we've had around it has been fantastic um but now what's happening is that um sales are falling through because nobody wants a leasehold house anymore which is quite right they shouldn't be because categorically why is a house leasehold because it's on its own plot of land I just don't get it um i just think i just think they've just got greedy mm -hmm. so so we're finding that houses are falling through but then flats as well you know um with the, with the dangerous cladding, you know, who pays for that bill? Poor little leaseholders end up footing the bill all of the time. Everything is a battle. Why? Why does everything have to be a battle? These are our homes. So, you know, we're seeing lots and lots of different issues. We're seeing issues with shared, shared ownership, you know, because there's nothing shared about shared ownership. And it's definitely not owned because you lease it. So, yeah, there's loads of issues, flats, houses, cladding, shared ownership, help, help to buy, help to buy. <laughs> I use help to buy, help to buy. Help to buy what? I lease, I'm a leaseholder, I don't own it. I'm no. a tenant. So, you know, it's just, the terminology is wrong mm -hmm. and it's very misleading and we're not all property experts. I, I wish I knew then what I know now. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm a children's nurse. I shouldn't have to have, have gone through this horrific journey to understand the basics. Um, but it's all dressed up. It's all window dressed into this lovely sellable product that we can all afford. Well, we might be able to afford it on day one, but shortly soon afterwards, all of those charges escalate. And it's not just the, the ground rents, it's, it's the service charges. They, they look really attractive on day one. Then if you go to them in three years time, they've, they've doubled, quadrupled. And this is not what people are signing up to. And this is what people don't realize. And this is why we need to educate people so that they can make an informed decision whether they want to get into this or not. Mm -hmm. I completely agree with you. <laughs> shared ownership needs to be binned. They should, they should not be offering shared ownership anywhere. I'm, I'm honestly, yeah. I'm so far against shared ownership. I mean, yeah. you listen to the podcast. Most of my listeners listen to the podcast. You know, the trouble we had getting Chris out of his shared ownership. I swear to God, it was the, the most frustrating thing we've ever been a part of. And luckily we have good money coming in so we could afford the 20 grand hold costs of having two properties yeah. who normally can do that like nobody yeah. especially if you're a first-time buyer you plunge everything into it it's I, the help to buy schemes as well come with so many little nuances about what you can and can't do yeah and people think they're being helped right and you think it's really easy and then all of a sudden you find out you're involved in developers solicitors do not use developers solicitors hey yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> right yeah 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 are you, are you finding that because recently i've heard and we didn't talk about this but we need to talk about this and i'm sorry we're doing a bit of a segment because this has only come up for me in the last couple of days with people talking to me about it Developers of new builds who are selling leaseholds have certain solicitors that they want to use so that they yeah. don't have to give the proper advice or at least they mm. bypass stuff yeah. that's friendly to the developer. That yeah. can't be right. Absolutely. They have these panel 
lawyers that you know they don't want to pick things up because they wouldn't be on their panel they wouldn't get the workload that's coming through and um, yeah I when when I, when I went into the sales room there, there, was, there was a little sign on the desk saying oh you know we recommend these because that that you know they they know help to buy they know the development it would go through in, in the 28 days that I had to exchange you know everything's rushed and you just kind of go with it um but yeah, these issues with these panel lawyers, absolutely, you've got to get independent. They are not independent. And they're still doing it now. You know, there's nothing illegal about panel solicitors. So which is why we need to educate because people are being caught out. And with the leasehold issues, people say, well, surely you're, you should be suing your conveyancing solicitor. Unfortunately, by the time people realise that they've been allegedly missold or there's been issues with it it's too late your time barred after six years so when when your lease doubles after 10 years you're already four years past when you can you can bring a claim against your solicitor so you know that clock is ticking and they're very clever the way they put in their first review at 10 years because they know all of this they know you haven't got a leg to stand on when you want to sue your solicitor mm -hmm. so it's just cleverly orchestrated it really really is all those panel solicitors, they fold, they they open them mm, up for a certain yeah. period of time and then they fold them. Yeah. Is that ethical practice? No. But a conveyancer is not the same as a solicitor. They are different. So conveyancers yeah. can fold them. Solicitors wouldn't because they'd be barred from trading. That is yeah. the difference. It's mm. not protected in the slightest. And that yeah. is a conflict of interest, completely unethical and seems to be happening all the time. Yeah. Absolutely. And with the promotion at the minute on these shared shared ownership, government's going mad on everything should be shared ownership. And, you know, but they're just creating more mess. They're just creating more mess when they need to look and clear up the mess that they've created before they they build, 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 you know, build the right type of properties, build the properties that people want, you know, what not what will make them the most money. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. And this complete this. Now, I'm going to put the full disclaimer that I know that not every freeholder is a bad egg. I do know yeah. plenty of yeah. freeholders yeah. who tend to be quite lenient. They've inherited the freehold. The freehold has been going on for hundreds of years. Like there is a difference between the good and the bad. But what seems to have happened from what my viewpoint and Katie tell me if I'm like wrong but is in like the last 10 to 15 years there has been this trend in the market to these freehold leasehold developments where the freeholder has suddenly decided that they can charge above and beyond for everything and then they're just capitalizing on it right it's it tends absolutely to these, these new build big blocks yeah yeah they've they've seen leasehold as as a second income stream and that's what they're using it for as a cash cow where, where, where was the old fashioned peppercorn ground rents, which was built on old fashioned church land, you know, they were relatively harmless, you know, they never caused any trouble, but develop, the big builders have got far too greedy. And I do feel for the, for the smaller developers who are ethical, you know, who, who do want to do things right, but the big boys get all of the money and they're just, they've destroyed the whole sector mm -hmm. just through their greed. Because also, if you charge someone too much and you repossess the house, what are you going to do with it? Because then you have to pay the charges yourself. <laughs> <laughs> do you know, I think all, all those in those dangerous cladding would love to hand back their flats to the, the freeholders or the developers and say, there you go. But they won't want them back. They're, they're valued at zero. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing is as well, at that point, you're like, What's worse, paying this extortionate eighty thousand pound bill? Some some people are having more, or declaring bankrupt bankruptcy, telling the bank you can't pay it anymore. Have that sat on your record for the next six years, but think, okay, I can start again. What would you rather? And that yeah. is a terrible decision. It is awful that people are going to be faced with these decisions, and it's gonna it's gonna affect them for a long time because people don't want to be bankrupt, or you know they shouldn't have to be through wanting to own their own homes. No, definitely, definitely not. So, I don't, where do you see these bad practices starting to impact leaseholders, and how does the cycle then grow? 
just repeat that question again. How, how, how does leasehold impact on people? Yeah, so how does, how does such bad, how, bad leasehold practices, how are they impacting leaseholders? What, what's like the result of this? So the result is that people are trapped, you know, I quite often use the term trapped in the leasehold scandal because they are literally trapped. They can't sell the properties because no buyer will want to buy it under those terms that the original mortgage was made under. Um, and now the mortgage the mortgage lenders are getting wise as well, whereas they won't lend on them. So your buyer can't even get a mortgage. So if you're fortunate enough to get a cash buyer, then you might be able to get out of the leasehold thing. But if you haven't, then mortgage lenders won't lend on them. They won't lend on ground rents, which are more than 0.1% value of the property. They won't, they won't land, lend on ground rents that are over 200, £250 a year outside of London, £1,000 inside of London, because that's an assured short hold tenancy. You know, doubling ground rents, they won't lend on a doubling ground rent, which is ironic because they lent on them in the first place. Yeah. So we have kind of in the short term made a rod for our own backs, but it has to get to this point before practice is changed. Yeah. And that's hopefully what we're trying to do is trying to change bad practices because the more they continue, I mean, I'm, I, I, I work in medicine, so everything's informed consent. You know, we, we learn every day from bad practices. It's not about blame, it's about improving it for the future. And I think this is what we're trying to do here. We're trying to improve it so that people aren't stuck in it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What do you think is the scariest thing about owning leasehold? Ah, you said the word, you don't own it. I think for me, when I had that penny drop moment that I was a tenant for the duration of the lease and I have a landlord and, but I'm, I've also got a mortgage, so I'm a mortgage tenant. So I think for me, my penny drop moment was when I realised that I'm not, a, I'm not a homeowner and I think we need to look at what is home ownership in this country mm -hmm. because leasehold I would argue is not home ownership it's not true home ownership in the word in any sense of the word really because you know at any point if you default your home will be taken off you through forfeiture because that's such a draconian measure um just for you know for you know life things happen covid happens people lose their jobs you know um and unfortunately, because you're a leaseholder, you still have to pay these bills. And yes, you may forfeit your property or even worse, if your ground rent's over £250 a year, it's an assured short hold tenancy. So the, the, the courts can't even grant relief from forfeiture and you go for possession. It's an automatic right. So, you know, the, these again are all things which you, people may say, but that never really happens. No, it doesn't actually happen that often. It doesn't actually get through the courts, but the threat of forfeiture happens daily, you know, to pay a bill, otherwise we will take action for forfeiture. It's used as a weapon all of the time. Every day, leaseholders being threatened with forfeiture just as a weapon so that they pay their service charges and they don't dispute them. And it's terrifying. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because the the biggest problem is, is that sometimes you see these charges and you think, really? But then if you don't know any better, mm. what do you do? Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, it's right. And it's so much harder for flats because you don't want to upset your neighbours. So in a, in a house, you know, I, I can kick off and rant and scream as much as I want. But if you're in a block of flats and you start to make noise and you start to argue with the with the freeholder and other neighbours are like can we not just pay it it ends up costing you more because you have to take them to um ftt the first the first tier tribunal and it gets expensive for all of the leaseholders so for that one person that's standing up for what's right and challenging the, the reasonableness of these service charges because you know this term re reasonableness what what is reasonable you know so you have to keep challenging them all of the time and it's tiring and it's expensive and it costs your neighbors because it gets added on to their service charges so it's just a revolving door so sometimes I really feel for flats because they haven't got the same voices that that leasehold houses have because they don't want to upset their neighbours and make the bill even bigger. Quick question on that though. I, this is something I have to share that's only happened in the last week for me. Um, if you do find yourself in this situation where you are challenging the reasonableness of service charges or you end up in the first tier tribunal, 
Before you get to the final hearing where the decision is made, all leaseholders need to submit a section 20C notice to the tribunal. That is that you don't want cost to be paid, right? And if for any reason, the head leaseholder or the freeholder has been unreasonable, if they've been difficult, you can prove that they've been messing you around, chances are the costs won't be awarded to you. I mean, you might get a percentage of it. So last week, um, got the final decision out of the leasehold tribunal that I've been through, 90% of the costs of that tribunal that's been dragging off the last seven years to the head leaseholder as being told off, like, do not bring this back on our doorstep. We got 10%. And the reason that the leaseholders got 10% costs was because the judge said to us next time, try your hardest to go and sit down and have a, st a calm conversation with your head leaseholder. Some of the other le leaseholders are wound up about that but I would take it as a win I do take that as a win like at oh, least yeah. you can get half the cost in the grand scheme of things <laughs> <laughs> absolutely so please yeah. if you guys are doing use that notice submit it the court will talk you through how to do it they ask them for the section c section 20c notice they will send that through to you you just need every single person in the block unfortunately to agree but the way that we did it, we had 10 leaseholders. We sent around an email that said, urgent, do you want to save yourself some money? Then we had a call, everybody got on the call and we signed it. That's annoying, but there is ways around it. Thank God. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> but it is quite hard though, isn't it? In, in larger blocks of flats to actually find who lives in these properties. So, you know, that quite often they don't even live in the country anymore. Um, so it is hard to find That's your neighbours. That is so true. Yeah, you have to make friends with everybody and be knock door knocking. <laughs> Who are you paying your rent to, tenants? <laughs> you landlord's details. I don't know, I'm probably the same as you. I'm quite like, I'm like a dog to a bone in that kind of thing. Give me the details of this person. But again, you shouldn't have to be like that. You're right yeah yeah it just it's it's just a war <laughs> it just feels like you're in a constant battle all of the time oh I you know it's it is it's it's a battle for everybody and it's draining it's really draining seriously draining and yeah. it's how scary is it when so a solicitor comes after you like, mm. you know when you start getting legal letters you either bury your head in the sand and think nah that it's not true how can this be real all oh, the anxiety that it causes if you have yeah. the money yeah yeah it does really worry me i mean we, we have leaseholders contacting us who have left who have just literally ignored all of these demands and then only when they're about to literally lose their property will they go oh i need to do something about this you know they've had warning after warning but that's just people's mentality they just have their head in the clouds and they think it's going to go away but this will not go away. Um, and I feel for the elderly, for the, they're really vulnerable. You know, they, they, don't, they don't understand any of this. No, and that's the thing. Imagine if you can't read because your eyesight's poor or, mm. you know, elderly people sometimes can't even afford no. electricity. They can't afford their water. They can't afford their bills. And all of a sudden you're coming after them for this. You know, the, yeah. You can't expect people to be putting away X amount of pension or what have you if they don't even have it in the first place. Mm. It's, there needs to also be more transparency behind charges, I think. And whilst the RECS do a pretty good job of it, I don't know any of these big house builders who have regulated managing agents who have to follow it. And that is an issue. Mm. Yeah, that, that's something that hopefully they're going to um, to sort out because anybody can be a managing agent. <laughs> it's it's crazy, you know. But again, I don't want people to think that we're complete. We, we need good managing agents. We, we need them. We need them to run our homes. Um, you know, these blocks of flats will not run themselves. And but the difference with I mean, obviously, we'll we'll go on to the issue of common hole. But 
you know, at the minute, the ma managing agents, they, they work for freeholders. We, we want them to work for us. We want them to work in our best interest, not in the best interest of somebody that we don't even know who they are. Mm -hmm. I completely agree. I completely yeah. agree. I am on a mission <laughs> to make um, people better property managers. That's like seriously part of my like, this is the reason I'm in property because there are so many terrible property managers and there are so many times when I even think I said to one of my property managers who manages one of the books do you think I'm an idiot do you honestly think I'm an idiot and I can't add like how did you get to this figure <laughs> and what is going on and they come back and say oh no Natasha like this x y and z means x no it doesn't real layman's terms bearing in mind that I know what the hell I'm on about and you're yeah. BS me like I'm not the person to do it to <laughs> not definitely <laughs> not the person to do it to but they will not apologize that's the other thing if you're a property manager hold your hands up say I'm really sorry I got that wrong because we're all allowed to make mistakes what we're not allowed to do is then keep trying to blame other people. Nothing to do with me. Not my job. It is your job. If you're the property manager for a block, take responsibility, and do things correctly, or at least try your hardest to. That's as far as it goes. Whew. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> you got that off your chest. <laughs> oh, that was my chest. Right. Um, what should leaseholders be aware of when they buy? Oh, um, the fact that you don't own it, they need to be aware of the, um, the, the the terms of the lease, the length of the lease. So this golden number, this 80 years, you know, um, people don't realise the 80 years um, left on your lease issue is is a is going to be very costly. And um, I think that freeholders do kind of, um, they, they keep that to themselves because they say, as soon as you've gone past that, this ka -ching! <laughs> ka -ching! you know every single month that goes by it's another ka -ching! <laughs> um, emoji so, yeah. dollar eye. <laughs> you know because you're just literally giving them money then your home is then becoming it's it, you know that that balance is just becoming worse you know um so definitely this this 80 years we, we need to educate on that um, we, we need to let people know what the burdens of being a leaseholder are, you know, what the responsibilities are and what what you have control of. Because for me, being a leaseholder, that's what I'm struggling with. The fact that I don't have control. Um, so um, if I was in a flat, then obviously the right the right to manage for me would be, you know, I'd be really looking at that in terms of having more control over where you live. Um, but again, the right to manage, a lot of properties can't do right to manage because they're mixed use. Um, so those with um, shops and hotels underneath where they live, they don't have the right to manage, um, which is hopefully what's going to change in the future. Um, so at least holders can take control and they can um, they can manage the homes that they work in. Um, what else would I? Um, yeah, I think that was it. Um, ground rent as well. Oh, um, the biggest one for me is the, the thing about lease extensions. So um, people people don't understand the difference between a, a statutory lease extension and an informal lease extension and the risks that are associated with both. So quite often, if, if, if the lease is going short, then the freeholder will, um, will come across as doing them a favour by offering them a lease extension. But actually what they put in there, because it's a, not a statutory lease extension, they bump up this ground rent. Um, whereas a statutory lease extension would relinquish, there'd be no ground rent to play because you'd have a statutory lease extension of, of 99 years plus your existing term on your lease and your ground rent will be gone. So mm -hmm. if you're doing formal deals, yes, the lump sum at the start might be less, but you end up paying a lot more in ground rent and then it just keeps them um, ticking over. So that cash point for them, you know, you're constantly being used as a cash point each year with your ground rent, which I have to say ground rent is the zero service, you know, ground rent should, should be gone, um, which is what we're working on as well. The government have committed that future ground rents will be set at zero. So that's why all these property developers need to take heed because ground rent will be gone. So the money from ground rent will be no more. Thank goodness. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so people need to understand the differences between the informal and the formal and, and 
I'd love to ban informal lease extensions because I just think they're toxic. Um, some of the stuff that people are agreeing to that they don't under, they don't realise is awful. Yeah, yeah, that's that's so true. And you know, even such clauses as the freeholder has the right to buy first before you put it on the market. Take that out. Do not let them have it. Yeah. I've I've fought tooth and nail for every single lease that I own not to have that in there. Mm. Do not want them involved. And also in the lease, put a cap on the amount that they can charge you for management packs. It may seem oh, yeah. really small, but that is a pain in the ass. And also put a long stop date of how long they've got to turn it around before they start paying you compensation. And it may seem like, oh no, I don't want to, I don't want to take time with that. I don't want to make them annoyed. I don't want this, that, and the other. Fine. Don't, I would actually nowadays recommend not buying something that you have no control over selling. I, I just mm. wouldn't. It means that it doesn't go on the market the way that you want it to. It could cost you buyers. Just walk away. If you have no control over the sales process, go find something else to buy. Yeah. Because that then moves us quite nicely onto the next question. Leaseholders having worthless properties. I mean, how does that happen? Well, obviously with the cladding issue, um, that's kind of, um, it's, it's bringing the, the, the flat sales to a halt completely. That is an absolute mess. Even buildings that don't have flammable cladding, they need to get an, e, an EWS1 form to, um, to say that their building is safe. There's about a 10 year wait on having an EWS1 form and it's being done in risk um, order. So obviously the higher the building, the, they'll get theirs done sooner. So that means that if you're in a little three or four story flat and you need this EWS certificate to sell, you're pretty much in a worse situation than those people that are in a higher rise building because they're going to get their EWS one first. Um, so flats at the minute, it's literally grinding to a halt. Um, so government really need to, to intervene there massively. Um, in terms of what else is, is valued at zero, impossible to sell a doubling ground rent every 10 years unless you do a deed of variation. Mm -hmm. So that sounds brilliant everyone's like oh yeah we'll sign the deed the deed of variation to convert from a doubling ground rent to one that um, goes up with our with rpi that is not a silver bullet that will not fix all of the problems because what we're finding is your ground rent still above 250 pounds and mortgage lenders won't lend on ground rents that are more than 250 pounds often even if it's below 250 pound if it's more than 0.1 percent of the value of the property then you still can't sell because people can't get mortgages on them because that's considered onerous. So, so it is no silver bullet to do a deed of variation from a doubling to an RPI. It doesn't fix all of the problems and might not necessarily make your house or flat sellable. So people need to realise that. Um, that you know, and and also, um, I've seen ridiculous amounts of of um, money being charged to do a, de a deed of variation four, five, six, seven thousand pounds just to do a deed of variation to vary the lease that was unfair in the first place. Um, so it's crazy. I know. And then you have to do the feasibility analysis of what's better. Yeah. Should I hang yeah. around until ground rents go to zero and not spend this money right now? Or am I going to be, I mean, the whole then, thing is just. But then the thing with the ground rents that are going to go to zero, that's only for future ones. So that's not helping existing people. So oh. our ground rents will still be. So, that, so they can't go back because it's contract law. So your ground rent is whatever your lease says. So, you know, so you're going to have a two tier housing market because you're going to have the future ones, which are much better. But then that leaves all of us in, in this in this crisis um, that kind of like need a way out. <laughs> so bad and so bad um what is your best advice for a leaseholder in a seemingly no way out scenario oh goodness um join the campaigning um it seems what has been fantastic and this is this has been my 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 cloud silver lining is the incredible force and solidarity 
that leaseholders have had. It's been amazing to see how we've come together to have a voice. And I think that's been down to Twitter and Facebook and social media has been amazingly um, supportive for us because, you know, it's given us a way of contacting each other. And as a leaseholder, you can be really lonely. You know, you, you, can, you, you don't know that there's other people that are going through exactly the same as you. So through campaigning and reaching those people, every day somebody else has their penny drop moment that, Mm -hmm. oh no I can't sell why can't oh no let's join the national leasehold campaign and every day we've got new members joining and this they're, they're like two or three years behind us because we've been campaigning that long and they're like they're asking questions that we we were all asking three years ago so you know we've still got a lot of work to do but I would definitely say join join the campaigning contact your MPs because we need legislation and we need it to help existing people as well as changing it for the future mm -hmm. um so the i'm so excited about the work of the of the law of the law commission they've done fantastic reports and i would definitely say contact your mp get them to support all of those recommendations and get the government to enact all of their recommendations because the law commission are determined to make our homes our own and i think that's so important mm -hmm. and i think that's why i'm campaigning because we want our homes to be ours and um, through the work of the law of the law commission that is the blueprint to allowing this to happen and this is the blueprint to allowing another tenure common hold to flourish and i think with common hold being a viable alternative people might go oh no common hold we don't we can't get mortgages for that blah 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 people need to embrace it not through the eyes of leasehold it's it's exciting. Let's do it. Other people, other countries do it. Other, you know, it works in other places across the world. In fact, most places across the world, it, it can work here if we have a different mindset. Mm -hmm. So let's not just dismiss common hold because it's coming. So let's just embrace it, and that will be that will be the 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 ending of leasehold. And hopefully, my my overall aim is to get leasehold abolished but common hold will definitely be the, the sunset clause on leasehold. And over time, leasehold will sizzle out and common hold will be the best way to own a property in this country. I love that. What is the difference between common hold and leasehold? Control, control. It's a no. It is. You know, we still need managing agents. We, you know, we need them to run our blocks because they say, you know, if but pe people are against common hold because they think that we don't understand what we're doing and we're going to have we're going we're to be up in arms of our neighbours and you know the law commission's report I mean I'm no lawyer I won't pretend to know the ins and outs of common hold but I have complete faith that they've done a very robust analysis of common hold they've seen the legislation that needs changing they've they will fix it so that it is a workable viable alternative but we need that change in mindset. Yes, it doesn't. The problem being, common hold doesn't make developers and freeholders the money. Mm -hmm. So unless they're forced, so they need to mandate new builds to be common hold because it's only if they do that and they incentivize it, then it will be it will be used as a viable alternative. And the preferred alternative, it needs to be the preferred alternative. And the thing is about education, isn't it? If everybody knew about it and everybody had some sort of, I don't know, people like to digest information really quickly nowadays, so probably not a brochure, but if there was something or before you were buying a, um, a leasehold property or a common hold property or a freehold property, you had to do X amount of training, you know, 15, 20 minutes. So you know what was going on. All yeah. of a sudden you become an informed buyer. Yeah. And that's terrifying yeah. for people who don't want informed buyers to be purchasing from them. Oh. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and I think I think that that's what we've found over the last few years is people are asking the right questions now about leasehold, which is fantastic, but developers don't like it. They don't like these and estate agents don't like the questions neither because you know the the way 
the way properties are advertised by estate agents, sometimes it doesn't even say that the leasehold, it doesn't give the term, the, the, the length of the lease. Those are basic information that should be there upon any Google search that is basic information before you go and view a property. But even the basics aren't there because pe people are still hiding them. Yeah, because they just want to sell and they want to make as much money as, as physically possible. Do you ever see a place for leasehold? No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I know, I know. I'm not naive enough to think that I can suddenly wave a magic wand and suddenly there will be no leasehold. So, you know, although our ultimate aim is to abolish leasehold, there is a process. There's a long transition from it sizzling out. Um, but I do believe it can be sizzled out. I don't think that in, in this, in this, in the 20th century, 21st century, we should be having leasehold it's it's not it's not home ownership it doesn't work in other places in the world and we just need to embrace change and just change our minds but leasehold's so embedded in this country it goes back so donkey's years you know um and it's a culture change it's a culture change mm -hmm. um and people are fearful of change um but the more people that embrace it i mean we've got a fantastic builder called hopton build like like we spoke about before um he's a proper ethical build, builder up in yorkshire and he's building common hold and that's solely because of the national leasehold campaign that you know he thought i can't i can't build properties and, and sell them it's apartment blocks as leasehold so he he is he's literally building and selling common hold which i take my hat oh. off to them in hopton build um, because you know he sees how unjust the leasehold system is wow wow oh my gosh well that's a brand new way of doing it but so such an interesting way of doing it as well and I'm, I'm glad to see it moving forward because if more if more and more people do it you know we just need so all of those developers out there, just do it, you know, do it. And, and that would be a good benchmark for people and other people will copy and follow. And then it, you know, more and more, and it will grow. Then more, more lenders will lend on it. You know, we can make this work. We really, mm -hmm. really can make it work. I'm a hundred percent sure. That's so true. And lenders do follow the market. Oh my gosh. Like we've seen it this year with service accommodation lending. They lend on strange HMO deals, they lend on strange student let deals. When they see demand in the market, they change their lending criteria. And that is what we need to be pushing for because if your broker goes to loads of different lenders and say, hey, I've got a common hold apartment here, there's over 350 formal regulated lenders in the UK. Someone's gonna say yes, because they're gonna go, oh, that's less risky. Why not? Let's give it a try and see what happens. Um, but if we don't ask, we don't get. So finally, looking to yeah. the future, what do you hope will be the best outcome for leaseholders and the property industry as a whole? I hope that they can give consumers what they want. I hope that um, people, property developers, listen to what the consumers want and they build and they sell what the consumers want. And that is to make our homes truly ours. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that is, that is simply it. I'm not, I'm not against people making money out of property at all. Um, you know, we all have our ways of earning a living and that's some people's and that's absolutely fine, but it's about what is ethically right. And mm -hmm. people want to own their homes. So let them do it. But but property developers need to help us in, in, in achieving that. Mm -hmm. I completely agree. I completely agree. Katie, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the oh. podcast. Thank you Thank for Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed it. I've really enjoyed it. Oh, my pleasure. I'm going to put the link to all of the National Leasehold campaign down in the show notes so that you guys can go and check it out, have a look, support, follow, see what's going on. Because for those of you that, own leasehold properties you need to be following this do not put your head in the sand things are changing we need to be aware of it and we need to keep following and supporting oh, katie thank you thank you so much thank you everybody for listening today if you've liked this podcast please don't forget 
to rate and review and share it so that everybody else gets the goodness. Thank you for listening today. I cannot wait to catch up with you all soon.